All right, we've just finished talking about polymers and crystal structures, and it was beautiful. Every atom just so in this perfect repeating pattern, everything perfect, but in the real world, there's no way it's going to be that simple. So this chapter is all about imperfections, and we have two major questions we want to answer. First off, what types of defects or imperfections are possible in these structures, polymers and crystals, right? And secondly, how will these defects or imperfections uh, change the properties, right, that we care about? Um, and then more importantly, if they do change their properties, how can we control or engineer those for materials by design, right, to get a targeted material that has the properties you want, even though it has defects, right? So to dive into that, there's a couple different categories of defects. They can exist in 0D, meaning at a single point in space, there's a problem, an imperfection. It could be 1D, like a line, 2D, like a plane, or a three-dimensional volume, which is all defective in the structure. So we're going to start with 0D, or point defects, and we're going to start with metals first, because they're the simplest. In metals, there are essentially two types of defects that we're going to have. You can either have a vacancy or a self-interstitial. Those are certainly the two most common ones, okay? A vacancy is very simple. It's a spot in the lattice which would normally be occupied by an atom, but it's now empty, right? It's empty of that atom that should be there. Um, and essentially all crystalline materials have defects, right? They all have vacancies. Now why? Why should something have a vacancy? Okay, the question is, what should be the driving force, right? Think of this in terms of driving force. What should be causing that? Well, in driving force, we know that's Gibbs free energy. We know that Gibbs free energy is a sum of either, right? It's the entropy contribution and the enthalpy contribution. So when you have a lattice, right? You got this lattice and there's atoms on every spot, just perfect. And you introduce a vacancy. Think about the bonds to that, right? Now you've got this bond gets broken, that one, that one, that one. Maybe the one in and out of the plane also get broken. So from an enthalpy standpoint, this is not favorable. But what about entropy? Well, yeah, it becomes really favorable from entropy, right? Because this vacancy could also be over here. Maybe it can move, and it can move over here, right? Because it can exist on many different spots, that is disorder. So entropy is driving vacancy formation, okay? And the one that's preventing it would be enthalpy, right? All right. Vacancies are what we call thermally activated. And in material science, when something is thermally activated, that means that we can use the Arrhenius equation. The Arrhenius equation is whenever you have a property P, which is equal to some constant out front multiplied by the exponential of a negative activation energy divided by thermal energy. And that can be either on a per atom basis, and that's when you'd use Kb times temperature, or on a per mole basis, and that's when you would use R instead if it was per mole, right? That is the Arrhenius type of equation. And you can see that with vacancy formation, it's no different. It's right here, right? NV is the number of our equilibrium vacancies, right? At equilibrium, it's how many vacancies we have. N is the total number of atomic sites where those vacancies could exist on, right? QV is going to be our energy of vacancy formation, KB's Boltzmann constant. It might be smart since we're talking about uh, something that happens on a per atom basis. We're going to do it in electron volts per atom rather than joules per mole, right? Because it's a really small amount of energy. So let's not use the large version of kilojoules or joules per mole. Let's do electron volts per atom. And then temperature in Kelvin. Let's do a quick example calculation of this. The question says the following. For copper, if the vacancy formation energy, right, the energy formation is one electron volt, what would be the vacancy concentration in that crystal at 800 Kelvin? Okay, well, we can do this. The concentration, well, the concentration means the number of something divided by the total amount, right? So that's going to be NV, the number of vacancies, divided by the total number of sites. That would be the concentration, okay? That's going to be equal to exponential of negative 1 electron volt divided by kbt, so 8.617 e to the negative 5 electron volts per k, multiplied by the temperature, which was 800 Kelvin. When I plug all those into my calculator, I get a value of 5 e to the negative 7. So what this means is that even in a metal like copper, which has a relatively small vacancy formation energy, 1 electron volts, and a relatively high temperature at 800 Kelvin, you still have very, very few vacancies. It's not like you get a huge fraction of your crystal is empty. It's a very small amount, right? One per 10,000-ish, right? In fact, uh, for most metals, if you look up the values of their formation energies, 
and you look up temperatures near their melting temperature, right, all the way clear up to their melting temperature when you might expect that there's lots of thermal energy to break these enthalpic bonds and allow entropy to dominate, you still only get concentrations around 10, uh, well, 1 e to the negative 4, right? So that would be one vacancy for every 10,000 sites. So it's not like these things are everywhere. They're still relatively rare, okay? Now, that's vacancies. Now let's talk about self-interstitials. Self-interstitial is when an atom crowds into one of the interstitial sites in a metal, right? Now, for, what would this look like? Well, take a look in this diagram here. Can you see a self-interstitial? Well, you've got a bunch of different atoms. Let's zoom in on this, right? First, let's find the vacancy. That should be pretty obvious. Right here, you've got a vacancy, right? And what's going to happen is you'll notice that the atoms surrounding the vacancy get displaced a little bit, right? They're not exactly lined up, right? These things are not exactly lined up. They've been shifted over a little bit, up and to the left, right, like I've shown there. They're shifted towards the vacancy in the vicinity of that, okay? So it causes strain in the surrounding lattice. The overall lattice around this point gets strained because that vacancy is not, not there, okay? Now, what about a self-interstitial? A self-interstitial has to be the atom of the same type that gets put into one of the interstitials. These are the interstitial areas, right? This region between the atoms, that's the interstitial. So we see a very clear example of that right here, defect number two. That would be an example of a self-interstitial. They've crammed an extra atom in there. And look what it did to the lattice all the way around, right? The lattice is distorted all around it, right? This has become distorted, right? And the further and further you get away from that self-interstitial or vacancy, the lattice tends towards normal, again, if you get far enough away from it, okay? Now, what are the other defects present in here? Well, you've got a non-self-interstitial, but you have a interstitial defect right there. This smaller, it's a different type of atom, but it's smaller and it fits in that. Because it's a lot smaller, it doesn't disrupt the lattice nearly as much as the self-interstitial. This one's different, number four over here. This is no longer a interstitial. It's a substitution, right? The atom is, this was the site of a previous atom. They've just put a different atom on that site, and it's a smaller one. So it still causes these atoms to shift towards it a little bit as they try and uh, take up that empty space a little bit. So there is still some lattice strain, but it's less because this is a smaller atom, right? And you can also have another type of substitution with a larger atom. And now this time it's going to push the surrounding lattice around it. So these are the different types of point defects you're going to see in metals. Vacancies, self-interstitials, or interstitials or substitutions of different atoms. Okay? All right. How about this question? Would a vacancy or a self-interstitial have a larger energy penalty? Or in other words, which one's going to have the largest activation energy? Right? Will the vacancy or self-interstitial. A large activation energy means that's the price you have to pay from an energy standpoint to form this thing. So I hope you'll see that a vacancy should have a lower activation energy than the activation energy for a self-interstitial. Now why is that? Well, a vacancy, the atoms can relax into that spot a little bit, but a self-interstitial, they're going to have to really cram the atoms more out of the way, and so there's more lattice disruption with a self-interstitial. Okay? Because of that, self-interstitials exist in very low concentrations. The number of your interstitials, I, right, interstitials, is typically much, much less than the number of your vacancies. So that's point defects in metals.